We live particularly now in an era where video and audio can be faked to astonishing levels of accuracy. I think we'll probably see legislation, and I think we're starting to see it in some places, that protect people from being faked. One use for this kind of technology is virtualizing the real world. You're listening to Widdishian's podcast, where we take the ultimate sci-fi themes found in books and movies and discuss them with the world's leading scientists, engineers, and experts. This week's podcast is brought to you by our sponsors and preferred retailers, Wordery and the Book Depository. And the book whose theme we're reflecting on this week is the Culture Series by Ian M. Banks. Now, the Culture Series is centered on artificial intelligence and in the books they're called the Minds, where the robots control the universe and AI are accepted as citizens with incredible authority and wisdom. It is a little bit creepy. Uh, it does feel like we're moving towards that era at the moment really, really quickly. So highly recommended if you want to see into the future. The link to the Koji series can be found in the show notes. My name is Amy Rhodes, and in this episode, I have a conversation with Professor Tom Drummond, who is the head of Department of Electrical and Computer Systems Engineering at Monash University, where he is also Chief Investigator and Monash Node Leader for the ARC Center of Excellence in Robotic Vision. Let's have a listen, or should I say, a look into the future. So thank you, Professor Tom Drummond, for coming on Wittestian's podcast. This is season three, and we're talking about AI and robots. This particular topic, Tom, is based on the Culture Series books, which is centered around artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence ruling the world. So thank you so much for coming on. Let's get into the interview. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Okay, so in the book... AI are accepted as citizens. They intermingle with people and they are very much smarter than humans. Now, I'm aware that you've been involved with AI, machine learning and robotics for a long time. Can you tell me a little bit about how you got into it? Like, was it a passion from a child? You just loved robots or it sort of just fell into your lap? And also what you're doing right now, like what is your passion right now in this field? All right. Okay. Well, that's a terrific question. Let's think back. So I guess I'd been interested in intelligent systems, whether that's understanding human intelligence or building artificial intelligent systems for a long time. And so when I did my PhD back in 1994, it was very difficult to make a lot of progress on some of the deep aspects of AI but there was a lot of activity in computer vision. So I went into computer vision at that time, and essentially I was interested in building systems that would understand the world through the medium of sight. So I built a system that was able to look at images and label parts of them, something that is now called semantic segmentation. Mm. Uh, So chopping images up into pieces with labels like desks and cups and chairs and tables and walls and floor and things like that. Is this used in software, like design software, sort of things like AutoCAD and that sort of thing? So that's a really good question. There are actually lots of uses for it. One use for this kind of technology is virtualizing the real world. So I might see an object in the real world and use a camera to take pictures of that object, maybe a chair or a car, and then I will want to build a 3D representation of that object in a virtual world. Mm -hmm. So I can use computer vision technology to create virtual representations of real objects. Okay. Another use might be for a robotic system doesn't necessarily need to build an internal 3D model of a real-world object, but it needs to know what's happening around it. So it needs to be able to see where the free space 
on the floor or the road is so that it can navigate through space without bumping into other things. It needs to be able to see what kind of objects might uh, it might interact with, whether the, in the case of autonomous vehicles, that might be other road users, or it might be information like from traffic lights or traffic signs and things like that. So with autonomous cars, and this is one of the questions, it's way down, but because you brought it up, mm-hmm. you sort of design like thing. If an automated car is driving along and it sees some obstacles in its way, sort of like an old lady and a child. I don't know, I'm jumping way ahead and you probably know what's coming. <laughs> I, I, yes, I think it's called the trolley car problem, but do continue. <laughs> yes, yes. So what happens is, so you've designed this little kid and you've designed this old lady and you've put that into an autonomous vehicle and then the autonomous vehicle is told if it's going to crash, is programmed to avoid one of these people and so can can we talk about that a little bit about this so we're jumping way ahead but I'm really interested in what you have to say about this so this is a really interesting difficult challenging problem ideally and most people working in the autonomous vehicle space are being rather cautious But ideally, we would drive in such a way that this wouldn't happen. But I think we can all imagine that, you know, old lady and the child might emerge from between two vehicles previously unseen. And this happens to human drivers too. Mm. And sometimes we have to make decisions. I think that really in this situation, it's very difficult for an AI system to make a decision that will be completely free of criticism. In general, it has to be able to try to minimise the human harm. But I don't know, I couldn't tell you which decision I would make under that circumstance. It's not an easy decision to make, I think. Mm. So, yeah, I, I think that these ethical dilemmas are going to become important. I mean, maybe we do something very simple and naive, like minimising the amount of harm to the you know minimum number of people, which case do you say, oh, in that case, I'll hit the older person because they have less life remaining? That's a very yeah. difficult, very difficult question. Mm. Because this is programmed into it, into the machine, and this is why. And I saw an article, I can't even remember when it was, I might find it to put in the show notes later on, but I saw an article where this was programmed into an autonomous vehicle and it did have to choose, like, which person it would hit or something like that or where it would go or what it would do. So there's a lot of decisions that need to be made and I really feel for the people who are involved in the in the process because, oh, to have that on your shoulders. It's difficult because as the programmer, essentially, you are shouldering the responsibility for making that decision in the event mm. the machine makes the decision, but you have designed the machine and I think it's very important that you have a justification, at least, for having designed it the way you did. So can you explain to us a little bit about machine learning and how we teach artificial intelligence in the first place? Sure. I suppose we should begin by talking about what artificial intelligence is and then maybe what machine learning is. So artificial okay. intelligence. <laughs> Sorry. Like artificial you're here, Tom. It's <laughs> <laughs> right. We jumped ahead and we got uh, straight yeah, into Yeah, we did. Cars. I just got so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so in, intelligent systems are really systems that sense something about the world and make a decision. So... In the limit, you could argue that a thermostat is an intelligent system. Not very intelligent, but it senses the world and it makes a decision about whether to turn your heater on or not. Mm. As systems get more intelligent and are asked to process more data, make more complex decisions, then our perceived level of intelligence goes up. Now, in the early days of AI, we tried to hand engineer all of those things. So we tried to build systems that would drive a car in the same sort of way as we design a thermostat. So we can design a thermostat and it says, yes, if the temperature's above this, turn the heater off. If it's below this, turn the heater back on. 
For the early autonomous cars, we built systems that looked out of the front of the car and tried to see the lines on the road, who tried to compute where those were relative to the car and then make steering control decisions. But all of that was hand engineered. And it turns out that as the complexity goes up, it becomes harder and harder to hand engineer all of those things. Some aspects you can hand engineer, but at some point, what you need to do is say, well, this is the kind of system I want. And then there are a whole lot of dials, numbers that control exactly how the system behaves. And then what we'll do is we will expose the system to real data and allow it to learn what those numbers should be. In a modern deep learning system, there are millions or billions of those quantities. And Mm. those are learnt by observing the world and understanding how it reacts when you interact with it and understanding what things are good things to do and what things are not good things to do. Right. Okay. So I'm just imagining there's a robot sitting there and you just plug it into Google and it just learns everything about the world. Is that how it works? One of the things that you might want to do is recognizing what you're looking at. So maybe you're looking at digits and it's the number one or the number two. This is commonly used toy problem nowadays. So there's a big data set called MNIST of handwritten digits. And the task is to recognize what digits you're looking at from a small picture of the ink of that digit on the page. So that's an object recognition challenge. Mm-hmm. A more modern version of that challenge is the so-called large-scale image recognition challenge. And that involves looking at photographs to identify what's in the photograph. So that might be a dog or a cat or a bicycle or a ship or an aeroplane. And there are, I think, from memory, a thousand categories in that challenge. And so what you have is a computer system that at one end... You put in an image, some number of pixels. So for the early version of the ImageNet challenge, that was, I think, 228 by 228. Strange numbers, don't know why. And for each of those pixels, there's a red, a green, and a blue value that tells you what color each of those pixels is. And then all of those numbers in the input are subject to a whole series of calculations that results in if it's photographs, a thousand numbers coming out that tell you how likely the picture is to be of each of those thousand categories. In the case of handwritten digits, there'll be 10 numbers that come out that tell you what the computer thinks each of those digits is. And in between, there's a whole lot of multiplications and additions. And the multiplications are all controlled by numbers inside the system. So that's where all of those parameters in the system are. And you start with random numbers, and Hmm. put a picture in, and the computer says, oh, that's a cat, but it's not, it's a bicycle. And so what you do is you say, oh, computer, you got that wrong. You said this was a cat, but actually you should make the bicycle number be bigger and the cat number be smaller. And the computer adjusts all of those numbers in between the input and the output to make it a little bit more like that. And then you show it another picture and you do the same thing. And after some days of showing the computer pictures and adjusting all of those numbers, eventually it gets pretty good at recognizing things. And in fact, the most recent versions of computer systems that recognize these photographs actually outperform humans at recognizing objects and images. And how long does it take to train the systems I mean, because you can imagine I, I have a three-year-old and it, it's actually, he's, I don't know how slow he is, but he's taken a while to learn his shapes. And I mean, that's been three years now. So how long does it take to train an artificial intelligence system? That's a really good question for two reasons. The first thing that makes it different for a computer is that we are training the computer really from a slideshow. So a computer, this, these computer systems are learning in a very different way to a human. So mm. it's a bit like, if you remember flashcards at school or something like that, you would show the picture and the class would have to say what it is and then you turn it round and there's the word telling you that this is an apple or a bicycle or a car or whatever it is. Really, that's the model that we're using. So this is so-called supervised learning where we are constantly... Right 
millions and millions and millions of times over telling a computer what the object in the picture is. So the simplest systems do this really can be trained in something like an hour or two. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Now, the higher performing systems take a bit longer and it might take a week or two. Oh, that's not long at all, though. Oh, my gosh. Right, compared to a child. But you have to remember, mm. we're giving these systems very high-value training information. Mm. I'm sure you spend quite a lot of time with your child telling it what things are. This is a square, this is a circle, this is a triangle, if it's shapes. But mm. you're not spending, you're not doing millions and millions of those. <laughs> Whereas, of course, the computer doesn't have an attention span or anything that constrains it, and we can pre-label all of these things and just teach it again and again what the objects are. But I, it's interesting that you brought up the comparison to human learning, because human learning is a very different process, really. In human learning, we are embodied in the world. We get to poke at it and see how it reacts. Hmm. Uh, we spend a lot of our time in curiosity or play, trying something out, maybe fitting blocks through one of those lids in the bucket I had when I was a child. <laughs> and so, so there's something very important about agency in that kind of learning. So it's not just data coming in and we're learning to recognize the data we're really active agents in the world and we're learning what the world does when we do things. And I think that leads to quite a different process for learning. We have to do quite a lot of what's called unsupervised learning in that context because we don't always have a parent telling us what things are. But the world always tells us how it reacts. And so we can mm. use that information as a really strong training signal. But do you think that they are going to be intelligent enough to make complex decisions? I mean, I'm talking about the, a decision for a country or a planet, if they can uh, <laughs> be leaders. What do you think about that sort of future? Is, is it possible or can you envision it? So I can try to imagine it. And I think probably what will happen is that computers will get better at particular kinds of things in different orders. So in the example I just mentioned, computers are now better than humans, at least in mm. that task of recognizing what things are. But there are clearly huge ethical issues when you start to ask computer systems to run a country to determine what the legal framework should be or to the case of military action to make decisions about who should die. These are not things that many of us would feel at all comfortable about delegating to a computer system, I think. And there's good reason for that, I think. Oh, absolutely. Have, oh, it scares me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> uh, I think we have a whole lot of problems already with the simple things that we're asking AI systems to do. So I don't know if you remember the experiment Microsoft did with their chatbot, Tay, uh, only yeah. really lasted 24 hours because what Tay did was it chatted with people rather freely over the internet. And some people thought it would be funny to turn Tay into an anti-Semitic monster. And of course, know, Tay quickly <laughs> learned to replicate what humans were doing. Yeah. And so Microsoft was left with no choice but to shut it down. And it turned so really nasty. It was yes, bad. yes, it was awful. <laughs> yeah, and it so that was people deliberately sending it astray. But I think perhaps the you know there are there are two things that people get wrong when they build AI systems, and it's probably worth spending a bit of time on those two things. One of the things that people get wrong is that they is that they feed their system contaminated data or biased mm. data and. I think it's a truth that the vast majority of AI systems are built by young men and they dominate the data that these systems see. Mm. And so the data can be not balanced or it can be contaminated. And in the case of Tay, uh, it was being deliberately fed contaminated data. But sometimes, sometimes that can happen by accident as well. So... There was an incident probably nearly two years ago now 
where if you did a search for professional hairstyles on Google Images or unprofessional hairstyles, you got, if for professional hairstyles, you got white women in the image search. And for unprofessional hairstyles, you largely got pictures of women of color. Really? Yeah, How's that now? That they might have. Oh, uh, well, I, <laughs> mostly when you do that search, you get pages talking about the problem. Uh, okay, so that dominates, okay. but you can certainly look for it. Sure, um, sure. Um, so, so this is a case where the data was contaminated. Perhaps the objective function, which is the other aspect that people get wrong, was wrong too, because the objective function for Tay and for image search was be like people. And be like people is pretty good most of the time, but sometimes people have prejudices or other behaviors that you don't want to an AI system to imitate. Mm. And so it becomes very difficult now to say, well, actually, I want you to be like people except. Yeah, don't, um, don't are, hurt other people. Uh, don't be a bully. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Well, it becomes very difficult. Take, for example, AlphaGo. So AlphaGo was uh, the very successful Go playing, playing program that DeepMind, now part of Google, created. And it was trained with an objective function of maximizing its probability of winning the game. So you might think this is a pretty safe and comfortable problem. It's a closed world. We know everything about what's happening in the game. Maximizing the probability of winning sounds reasonable. And it was, except that if you, I don't know if you watched this series two or three years ago with Lisa Doll. No, I haven't. Uh, the game number four was the game that Lisa Doll won. I think that's probably the last time that AlphaGo has been beaten because it's got better sense. But there was an interesting thing that happened, which is that he played an extraordinary move that was the machine thought was very unlikely, as did the commentators. It turned out to be a brilliant move. And it changed the entire structure of the board. And the situation went from one where he was behind into one where he was winning. And then what happened next was that the computer played moves that if a human played them, you might think were rude. So they're moves where there's a really obvious reply and the mm. computer is hoping you won't see the obvious reply. <laughs> but of course, you know, a Go player like Lisa Doll is never going to make that kind of mistake. And so there's actually, in playing a game like Go, there's actually a social contract as well that's present, although it's a bit subtle, which is that you, you know, if you have clearly lost, you should resign, which is in the end what uh, AlphaGo did. But of course, that was a hacked on as an afterthought in some ways mm. into the objective function of the game. So it said the programming was if the probability of victory drops below some threshold, then I resign. But of course, it had to eliminate these possibilities that perhaps, you know, if it were a human game, would not have been explored. And I mention that because it shows just how hard it is to get objective functions correct. You know, you can think that perhaps it might be great if we could code the universe with these things are good and these things are bad, you know, Asimov's three laws of robotics or whatever it is. Mm. But I, I suspect that actually defining or trying to get at what is acceptable or good behavior and what is unacceptable and bad behavior is actually much harder than that. And there won't be three laws of robotics or even 3,000. There'll be millions of laws of robotics and they'll be contradictory, you know, a bit like the conflict between telling the truth and being polite. So do you think it's going to be possible to have moral agency in these systems? Like, do you think we can train it to care? Because Joseph Weisenberg in Weisenbaum, I think that's how you pronounce it, in 1976 said that we can't replace people like nurses and judges and customer service and childcare. Well, we're already seeing them being replaced. But because you can't, they don't have moral agency, but do you think that's possible? Is that what you're saying? Like if we can teach it these things, then perhaps they can replace these roles? So I think actually it's very important to start thinking about how we build moral agency into AI systems. I think that the best way to address the problems that we have today with professional and unprofessional hairstyles or Tay 
or things like that is to have a framework for discussing with the AI system why some responses are unacceptable. I don't think we're going to be able to get at that problem without some rather flexible framework that looks a bit like the way you and I discuss what we think might be morally acceptable or unacceptable. So I would argue that we actually need something that looks a great deal like moral agency in order to get towards solving those kinds of problems. And in some ways, moral agency is closely related to another perhaps more immediate goal in AI systems, which is answerability. Mm -hmm. So if I wish to build a system with agency, with moral responsibility, then you know, there are some things that maybe it's going to need to have. It's going to perhaps need to be able to predict. So it might need to be able to understand what the consequences of its actions are likely to be. And a system that can understand the consequences of its actions may later be called upon to justify those actions. And one way of being able to say, well, the reason I steered to the left here was because I looked at these possible things that might happen in the future if I continued straight or if I steered to the left. This is the possible set of futures I saw, and this one looked as though it caused less harm than driving straight ahead. Hmm. And how difficult is it to embed moral agency into these systems? I mean, is it going to take years? Is it something that you're working on at the moment or anyone's working on at the moment? Is it even a focus? So it's certainly a long-term focus. I guess the things that I'm working on at the moment are things like building prediction systems. So if a system can predict what might happen, then we can start to think about how it can answer questions about decisions that it made in the past we can start to think about how it might understand better the consequences of its actions. But we can use prediction in other ways as well. Hmm. So if we build a system that can predict, we don't have to just train it in the real world. We can actually let it, if you like, dream on its own. So it can imagine how the world, it can imagine various worlds, what the world might be like, how it might react, and so it can imagine what it might be like to encounter a difficult situation when driving or perhaps something more mundane, like imagine what might happen when it's playing a computer game. I don't know if you ever experienced this, but uh, I know that sometimes when I've taken up a new task, I find myself dreaming about that task at night afterwards. <laughs> and, uh, That's when you love so, it, so the oil you're kind obsessed. Of an to that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So another thing that you can do with prediction is counterfactual reasoning. So you can look back in the past when things perhaps went wrong and you didn't expect it and rewind history a bit from there and say, okay, what do I think might have happened if I had done something different? So I can go back and think about how things were, imagine taking a different course of action and see if that turns out better than what actually happened. And then maybe I can learn from that and say, well, if something similar to that happens again, I can behave better. I've just been thinking about what you said earlier about how AI is possibly, in some instances, more intelligent than humans in different areas and faster at learning. But here's something that just popped into my head. So if AI is programmed to not have a bias and it does have moral agency, then, and let's just say it's standing next to a president who has some bias and this president has an agenda to do certain things. And <laughs> for he's example. obviously, for example. And <laughs> so you've got this AI system who is programmed correctly to do the right thing versus a president who's got some friends over here and some friends over here and wants to do this and that. I'm thinking that perhaps the AI system might be a better decision maker than our, or than a possible current, I don't want to offend anyone in what I'm saying, but could actually be better than the human to run a country. (laughs) 
So it's slightly hard to imagine that. I guess we have to remember that in most of the places we might think of, the humans doing that are elected. And so we have to have a, a long, hard think about how we feel about our democracy if we're going to start delegating those kinds of decisions that we delegate to elected officials at the moment to an AI system. I don't know entirely how comfortable I would be, but I could imagine that there will be a lot of AI systems in an advisory role, at least to begin with. So, you know, we mentioned decisions in war. That's an area that I'd be very uncomfortable about delegating to an AI system. And then coming back from there, there are perhaps decisions about sentencing or parole that, again, would be difficult and dangerous, perhaps, to delegate to AI systems, particularly because we live in an era in which the data is contaminated. But on the other hand, we can go all the way back to thinking about, for example, you know, the phone system. That's something we've delegated to machines. And again, at that time, people thought that might be problematic. But you couldn't have the number of international telephone calls that exist today without computers mediating the connections. You, know, you used to have to speak to an operator and they would actually physically plug connectors together to connect your phone call. We have live in an era where you couldn't possibly return to that. So it may be that as we become more confident in the correctness of AI's decisions, that we are happy to delegate more of our decision-making to them. I think we should take be cautious and take small steps, though. The law and ethics go hand in hand. Um, well, they should. And I'm just wondering if there's any legal framework in Australia maybe that you might be aware of that restricts people from making artificial intelligence systems that may cause harm? I mean, can anyone just go and create whatever they want? So I think probably like in most areas of technology that the law lags behind what people are doing. Mm -hmm. There is one area, I don't know if there's legal constraints around this in Australia, but I believe in America that if a bank makes a credit decision, they have to be able to justify that decision to a customer. Mm. And so if the decision is delegated to an AI system that's opaque, that suddenly becomes very difficult. So that's the only strong example I know of. Of course, there are constraints around driving autonomous vehicles on the roads, mm. although those mostly come from existing legislation around actually having a driver in the vehicle who is alert and awake and paying attention and in control of the vehicle. So there are some constraints there, but those are pre-existing. I think that it's going to become increasingly difficult. We live, it's been said, in a post-truth era, and we live particularly now in an era where video and audio can be faked to astonishing levels of accuracy. So I think we are facing, you know, a really difficult challenge on all of those topics. I think we'll probably see legislation, and I think we're starting to see it in some places, that protect people from being faked, the fake. But, yeah, it's going to be very, very difficult. Well, juicy, juicy. It's been wonderful, Tom. Thank you so much for sharing your time, and I will be in touch. Okay, thank you, Amy Rose. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode with Professor Tom Drummond. And if you're interested in taking over the world with AI, please let me know first. We might have to talk about ethics. Until next time, please subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. And stay safe. Enjoy the company of your loved ones and enjoy the rabbit holes. And don't forget, this is a pretty cut-up episode. So if you want to hear the whole uncut version, just go to our members-only area and sign up. I'll see you next time. Thank you.